All right, so I promised this earlier. I promised this before. I want to talk about Rey. Oh, boy. In Star Wars. And I want to talk about why that character, because it's already established that it makes fangirls go crazy, it makes fanboys go crazy. And I have a theory as to why. Because Rey, there's nothing terribly wrong with Rey. There's just nothing right about her. She has this frustrating middle of the road mediocrity that I think people are either incredibly frustrated by or they pour their own shit into her the same way they do with Bella Swan on Twilight. And that's why I think she's such a lightning rod. She's a cardboard cutout yeah, of a character. Yeah, yeah. There's really very little to her. And I, I couldn't figure out for a long time why people were getting so mad there's so little to her. Then I realized people are mad because there's so little to her. Yeah. And, you know, that's the difference between what the original Star Wars did, which was hire a bunch of actors. Most of them were really happy to be there. They'd never been in anything, so they were earnest and giving it their best versus hiring actors who you know have been through the royal academy of dramatic arts and they're serious and method and you just don't get the same shininess with and who are too schooled in space opera and the actors had personality yes it's like harrison ford carrie fisher mark hamill they've all got personality so they were able to take fairly standard stock characters and give them life and give them this personality and yeah that's why i don't understand why they keep casting actresses that look like carrie fisher because carrie fisher was carrie fisher you cannot be carrie fisher find somebody else who's their own personality and what's weird is it's Star Wars has this thing where almost all the women are these doe-eyed, dark-haired, brown-eyed yeah. girls. Yeah. And it made sense when it was Padme and Leia well, because they're related. They, yeah, yeah, exactly. And e- e- even Shmi has the same look. So right. I'm, I'm also kind of like, George... I, I wonder what your taste in women is. Yeah. I, I think I know exactly what it is. But, but at least, yeah, there had to be some sort of familial relation there. Yeah. And that that's why there was so many theories about, oh, well, who are Ray's parents? Because she looks like a Skywalker. Yeah. And, and a Nayberry. Because people were like, oh, she looks like Shmi, and she looks like Leia, and she looks like Padme. Well, and- but she also looks like non-threatening brown hair, McPonytail, safe, you know, safe intersectional feminist heroine. She looks Give a lot me- like Lara Croft from the rebooted games. Yes, actually. Yeah. And th- then they did the solo movie, and Amelia Clark dyed her hair brown. And it's like... I forgot she was in that. I liked the solo movie. For me, I, I've I've said this before, and for me, the Disney Star Wars feels like they took away my steak dinner of the EU, and they gave me gruel, and told me, but this is better because women. I just and- find it. I just find it interesting that they have this whole sandbox to play in now, and they keep. They keep prequeling and sequeling and tying in instead of telling a story in a completely different sector of the galaxy that nobody's seen before it's so strange they've talked about doing that yeah. and yet it never yeah. pans out like it I never think pans that's out what, that's what the game of thrones creators were gonna do yeah i i kind of love the delicious irony that they were like eh, we're bored with this we're just gonna rush the ending so we can get to the star wars movies uh, no, you screwed it up so badly. You don't get Star Wars movies See, anymore. I I found it interesting that they cited toxic fandom leaving Game of Thrones, and then they cited toxic fandom 
leaving Star Wars. And 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 that's the thing. It's oh, it was talk. No, it, that finale sucked. Oh, the it, it. I feel bad for them because they they did not sign up to be creators. They signed up to be adapters. And George R. R. Martin left them holding the bag. But even by those standards, yeah, you could tell it, everybody just wanted out. I think there was also a level of ego to it where they clearly wanted to leave even as HBO is saying hey we want like five more seasons and instead of handing it off to someone who could have done something with it and letting there be a new showrunner no they had to end it on their terms I and I do think that ego ego and creators is part of what's driving some of the toxicity you know the fans wear it but if you look at the behavior of some of these creators, now I, I do separate She-Hulk on this one because I think that the comments that people went crazy on were taken out of context. Mm-hmm. I saw the original clips. It was not as advertised. They were not taking swipes at the fans. They were taking swipes at the process. That, yeah. you know, people are going to scream no matter what you do. So why hum and haw for so long? Just make a decision right which i actually thought was right but you go all the way back to um moffat on doctor who uh during the tenant run and then when he did on sherlock you know with the queer baiting and Mm -hmm. and things like that and the way these showrunners deliberately encourage fans to run wild with speculation and build up expectations so fever pitch that there is absolutely no way anything's going to meet that expectation or but then they also mock the fans for it (laughs) like there was that when was it in sherlock that he died died quote unquote season two finale i think yeah and then season three the first episode is oh how did he come back and you've got these fans who it it, it was very clearly mimicking the tumblr discourse at the time yeah and i I checked out of sherlock when he poisoned watson's wife oh he just drugged her she was fucking pregnant man yeah that was disgusting like no i'm out i i never went back to it after season three granted just granted their take on irene irene adler was a desecration but you know, oh, it's Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, doe eyes, doe eyes. That's okay. And see, yeah. I'm being a toxic fan now. No, I'm not. This is this is legitimate, right? But who determines what's legitimate? Well, the majority. And that's the it, problem for me, right? Yeah. Back when Rings of Power first came out, there was a meme I found on Instagram where it was a bit from The Hobbit where the dwarves are like, do you offer us insults referring yeah. to Elrond and Gandalf is like no you fool he's offering you food yeah <laughs> it was edited to no they are offering valid criticism and it's and, like and, and and let's face it a lot of valid criticism actually isn't valid criticism true. but you know not all criticisms gonna be valid I yeah. remember the la- the first two episodes of boss fight that came out the number of that's cringe that's cringe oh my god that's cringe it's like guys this is 66 batman villain of the week stuff of course it's fucking cringe (laughs) what is wrong with you people you know like what it gets smart What, what did you of course it is it's cringe it's cringe it's cringe and i it's so what it's cringe so what it's cringe so what it's cringe so what oh my god you're cringe like that's not valid criticism no but But i feel the right to just say that yeah i i do feel part of labeling fans as toxic or misogynistic or this and that it's you get creators who they do that because they don't want to accept criticism because I have seen this in the creative community in the last 
decade or so it's gotten to the point where it's I don't want to be criticism criticized because this is my art this is my expression well the 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 one that really got to me was Neil Gaiman fighting with people over Sandman about the race swap on dream sorry not dream uh death yeah and that was that that was one where what he did was really unfair and I'm pretty sure wasn't death based on Tori Amos no, that's delir- uh, delirium. Death oh. was based on a woman who was a, a alternative model in the goth community who died. And so there's a bit of a protectiveness around that particular license. Now, of course, the artist made that decision, not Neil Gaiman. So, of course, he's not as connected to it. But that was a he made that about race and people not being able to deal and he did some really nasty things with people's fan art about it the the endless are described in a very particular way and that's one of those things where you are changing your lore if you change the way they look because they weren't the endless do not have a skin tone found on the human spectrum, mm-hmm. right? So I think people, if you'd gotten a black actress and CGI'd her, I think it might have gone over better. But the fact that you're just because, yeah, the whole onk thing, I'm not okay with people putting a white girl in that right now. That. Mm-hmm that symbol with the what was going on with goth at that point it it doesn't it doesn't age it doesn't age with the same meaning but he that is a lore change that is not just this is a character up with whom race is not dependent he's changing his own lore and that was probably netflix insisting that there be a certain contingent because the characters they race swapped i mean it was it was not well executed at all but he got so defensive and so aggressive before the things even out and i compare that to you know the 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 dad of war team the the god of war switches to norse mythology team and people Mm -hmm. were brutal on them just vicious uh oh you made kratos fat oh it's still misogynist oh it's still just sex and violence and that team was just like guys wait for it to come out like just trust us wait for it to come out and people were pillaring that game that game had a female combat director like there was so much good with that game and people were just no it's gonna be shit and of course then it comes out and everybody thinks it's great but nobody went we're sorry for beating the crap out of you beforehand you were right we were wrong yeah and i think the the i think that and people have told me this that the behavior of industry and the behavior of media has been what the so-called toxic fandom has been emulating so it didn't start with the fandom it it's the fandom emulating the way people who are getting paid to talk about this talk about this you know i was i was talking to a friend another one i met through comics and this one was a girl Mm -hmm. and she she had a year or two that was just awful and Mm -hmm. she's she's pretty much disappeared from the internet now Mm -hmm. um and I was talking to her because I specifically, as we were talking about fans, like I, I talked to some of my guy friends, but I was like, I, I want to talk to another girl who had a lot of the same opinions I did. Right. And like, this is a girl who she was into comics before. And right. she has one particular character that she absolutely loves, which I, I don't really want to name because she did have a bit of a name online. Okay. Um, and so I don't want to, right? I right, don't want to risk it coming back. Yeah, to her. yeah, 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 yeah. So, but in partic- this character in particular is known for being scantily clad. Okay. And so she said she was reading 
the comics when she was in college and some girls came up to her and started saying that's so sexist yeah and so that was part of what pushed her towards the online comics group and the male fans but one thing she pointed out is you know when guys want to bully you they just want you scared Mm -hmm. so you'll shut up when women bully you they want everyone to think you're crazy yeah so you have nowhere to go yeah and that that to me was kind of profound and that I was really thinking about that after she said it and that's that's what the JK Rowling stands attempted that's like flying, flying monkey tactic 101 yeah And I think that's part of why the culture war escalated the way it did, because suddenly you had women coming into what had previously been a male dominated space. Yeah. And even the women who were here, and like I do include myself in that, Mm -hmm. did operate kind of under more masculine rules. Sure. And so it's we didn't really have that kind of vicious bullying that's and part so- of the reason I liked it is my natural inclinations were I mean I still got punished for not being gender conforming but yeah it was better yeah and so suddenly we had more women coming in and they brought in this kind of vicious bullying yeah 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 the bathroom and then, bullying. yeah and so it's like for you and I who it's like we're we're used to it anyway yeah we were like okay this is a thing but I don't think men knew what was happening men don't men don't understand the dynamics they really don't yeah and so suddenly they were thrust into a war where they didn't know the rules yeah I I I should clarify because I can hear people getting all it's not that men are stupid it's not that men are incapable of knowing the rules they're just incredibly complex and unless you're indoctrinated in them since birth they're really hard to see and figure out yeah girl and world so- is a girl <laughs> world is a vicious place anybody that thinks a woman's bathroom is a safe space is the bully not the person being bullied i'll just yeah. put that there yeah and we've men- I've mentioned this in a previous one even in ultimate spider-man there was a scene where peter and mj were talking about bullying yeah and he's like oh yeah no it's great all the swirlies and being pushed into the lockers and the wedgies and mj is like girls don't do that we just pretend to be your friend and spread vicious rumors behind your back well and (laughs) and that's the thing right that if you're swirlied everybody knows what that is though i'm amazing i'm amazed at how many jk rowling fans to deny what was done to snape was sexual assault right if four boys took a woman hung her upside down pulled her pants down and in front of the entire school and pointed and laughed at her everybody would say that was third or fourth degree sexual assault everybody would here's the thing it over the last decade or so again it i feel like we've we've become more aware of exactly what that is oh yeah because i had a situation when i was in middle school where I did it took me almost 10 15 years to realize it was sexual harassment yeah yeah and I I couldn't figure out why I had these particular traumas and yeah just all these hang-ups just from this one conversation that oh, happened oh it, it that's all it can depending on how much shame it mm-hmm. makes you feel and I, I do think there's a lot of shame in this particular yeah you know this particular whole thing quote-unquote toxic I see shame all over it and I don't know what to do about it because I think that's very apt there are a lot of people walking around they do not understand how trauma is informing their reactions you know there's a phrase from world war one the walking wounded yeah yeah and it we have a lot of it going around and part of it is from bullying it's from poor parenting it's bad relationships it's all these things and it it manifests in the culture wars everyone is bringing all their issues to it as well as to every other aspect of life 
And it's like, y- you need, you need to deal with your stuff. And, and I think, unfortunately, the culture where has set up these pockets of certain people's pain is inherently valid and other people's pain is something to be mocked. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that is a race to the bottom if I've ever seen one. I've seen a lot of people wanting compassion and wanting a chance to speak and wanting a chance to be validated but they're not extending it. And un- unfortunately, the very people that, you know, the various factions are claiming to be wanting to help here are the ones taking it on the chin the most. Yeah. And I I do think that, I do think that the media companies and certainly the media outlets bear a lot of responsibility for the tone that's been set if it's so easy to just sit there and feel dumped on and not respond you would think that the people who are getting paid to do it would be able to set an example of that behavior and they're not they're out there saying stupid crap along with everybody else and i i do agree with you that's that's part of the reason i stayed out of comics gate because I saw the people whose initial positions I supported. I thought the milkshake photo was cute, right? Yeah. I was really surprised at the reaction to that. But you can't say you want people to behave better and then model behavior in yourself that you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of. And this is something I was talking to my best friend about last night is... You know, we've we've started to understand more our own issues and our own trauma, mm-hmm. but then people use that as an excuse and it's to not. behave poorly. Yeah. But even more, it's, you know, we used to have the idea of taking the high road and being the better person. Right. But now people don't want to take the high road and be the better person because they say that's more effort for me. Why should I have to do that? Well, it's also they see people be actively rewarded for the dunks and the ratioing and ratioing's one of the stupidest things I've I've, I've ever encountered. Just because something's unpopular doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah, it's just it's just so good Lord. No civil rights movement in history would be able to get off the ground if you could just go get ratioed and end it right there. And I I do think that there is a lack of an incentive structure for so-called toxic fanboys to behave any better because let's face it, what are the options for them right now? Be derided, you know, be vilified or be ignored. Yeah. And those aren't most people I mean we see it in children when adolescents are hurting and nobody no adult is intervening they act out they behave badly it's a cry for help and you know you're calling me an adolescent people get stuck emotionally at the age of their trauma so there are pieces of a lot of people engaging in these fights that are not adults and you know i had the misfortune once of being triggered by a game trailer at an e3 when i was live tweeting the event and said something that was accurate but worded in a way that got me dogpiled for years and nobody cared nobody cared that it was a ptsd symptom nobody cared that it it was a moment where I could not have been prepared to be hit with that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I, and it, it was still a factual statement. It was just the wording people had issue with. And, and, you know, I eventually, it was that thing where the only thing I could do is just say, yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, I was bad. Yes, it was wrong. And that was the anti-woke side. That was the anti-SJW side that was demanding I say that. So from that point forward, I don't buy this. Never apologize. Never apologize. They just use it against you because they made me. 
they yeah. weren't interested in why I did it. They didn't care what the situation was. I was a woman. I was a feminist. I was talking about one of their franchises. Get her. And, you know, it was it was a trailer for The Witcher 3. And it took a guy from Romania having me on his stream where we talked about, you know, the rape metaphors in The Witcher and how it is, because I said it was made of rape, right? Mm -hmm. And it happened to be a response to Gail Simone, which charged the whole fucking thing. And, you know, she has a, a full disclosure. He, she has not been very nice to me uh, mm -hmm. since that happened, which I'm sorry matters. You don't abandon people who support you just because, you know, a few things happen that you don't agree with. But, uh, and that that was why I stayed out of Comics Gate as well. I consider some people directly involved in that friends, and I didn't want to have to pick sides because, frankly, I thought everybody was behaving really poorly. And Agreed. I I saw some people who I previously respected going after guys like Frank Cho, and fuck that, Frank's a good guy. You yeah. know, uh, you talk to Frank, he is very not just respectful of women, but he treats women as people. Right. You know that, um, you know, there are some guys, they are respectful, but they're cold. Yeah. Frank, Frank is just, everyone's a person to Frank. Frank's just a guy. He's very creative, but he's very much a guy. He's funny as anything. He's got a really good attitude about life and he helps people when, when it, it comes down to, you know, providing sketches for my crowd funds or everything like that. Frank came through. And he's a brilliant artist. I love his cheesecake stuff. I've cosplayed a lot of his characters. He was very, <laughs> very, very positive for me personally in terms of body positivity and convincing me that I wasn't fat. Mm -hmm. But he's a good person as well. And so to see some other people that I was previously friendly with treating him like shit, I just, I couldn't. And to me, that's my benchmark. It's, is someone behaving honorably? And when I see pros acting like little mean girls and little schoolyard bullies and, and, and little just nasty, they should know better. They should be behaving like professionals. And that doesn't uh -huh. mean you don't go hard about something. That doesn't mean you don't disagree with someone. Guillermo del Toro did a takedown of this film critic lately who said Scorsese films weren't that good. And he was passionate about it but he didn't get dirty right yeah that's the standard you can disagree you can disagree passionately and strongly but remember that that person you're talking to is a human and when i see pros and i get why it's a very toxic business comics is not a good place to work i did some stuff when they were doing that whole, you know, hey, women, if you don't like what's going on in comics, write your own comic. You know, it's not possible. You need a major hype squad and PR people and an established infrastructure before anybody will even take a look at you. It's not just you write a great spec script. Somebody reads it, believes in you. Hey, you're in. They want people with a pre-existing fan base that will guarantee sales no matter how shitty the book is. That's and even prose want. publishing is the same way. Yeah. It's, they want you to have an established social media pl yeah. platform. Yeah. They want you to have this and that. And yeah. and that's that's more why you see the Wokies getting more uh getting more getting published just because of their, their social media accounts. Mm -hmm. Right. There just isn't the same um I can't think of someone on the right that isn't already highly monetized by the right with the same following. That's mm -hmm. the only difference. It's not an ideological thing. It's strictly a numbers game. All the streaming services are the same way. Canadian television is the same way. They want zero risk. They want a pre-existing fan base. They want a pre-existing reach. Meaning they're not doing their jobs, right? Yeah. And every once in a while, you get a Gerard way where the Umbrella Academy was okay. It, <laughs> it wasn't genius the way, um, 
the way some people claim. And every so often you get, you know, a ta Coates run on Black Panther. Nothing ta Coates has done since then has been as good as that run on Black Panther. He had, you know, the one story in him. Every so mm-hmm. often you get a Kevin Smith Green Green Arrow run. But a lot of the time you get... And I mean, the Dreamer stuff has been adorable. The stuff Nicole Maines has been doing on Dreamer. Mm-hmm. But I personally, I don't think that one's a woke one. She is, you know, she's a trans woman advising on a story on a trans woman. That makes sense, right? That's yeah. not woke. That's just, it's her freaking character, man. You know, yeah. if, if there was a, um, you know, a Firefly comic and Nathan Fillion wanted to contribute, nobody would be saying that's a problem. The I think the issue that people don't understand is when you get somebody who doesn't have a ton of comics writing experience um, with their name on a book and they're like, they didn't earn that. Well, it's it's what the comics companies consider earned because the stories are are set by the publishers. Yeah. So it's very rare that somebody like a Roxanne Gay, for instance, will go in and pitch an actual story arc. They already know they want to write it. They come in. They basically do the dialogue. The artist goes and changes 75% of it anyway, and then they go in and fill the word balloons. It's their name on the book. That's it. And this woke stuff. The thing that makes me so sad about it and the reason I want to talk about it is that too many people who I think are sort of grifters have convinced people of this big plot, you know, this big woke conspiracy. And yeah. it's not true. And that doesn't mean I think the people who believe it are stupid. I've I've seen the way they've laid it out it's just it's not the way the business works these people are sociopaths right they don't give a shit about gay rights they don't give a shit about trans rights they don't give a shit about women's rights or black lives or anything like that because they live in circles where if you have money you matter if you don't have money you don't if you have connections you matter if you don't have connections you don't everything else is irrelevant and I really think that some people are getting taken advantage of because their choices are, and I saw this in Gamergate, they felt like they were choosing between people who were going to mock their pain and people who were going to exploit their pain. And they knew the people who were exploiting their pain were bad people, but they chose it over mockery. Yeah. And I don't know what to do about that problem and I hate identifying the problem and not having a solution to it. So uh, how do you feel about trying to come up with some really flawed solutions so people can go all toxic and tell us we're totally wrong, but at least we're trying, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I, I've tried to think about it. Like, I, I, I don't know what a solution could be. Because... So- go ahead no go on my attitude is there's opinions and then there's behavior right and i think we do need to separate people who for instance i i don't know i don't i don't know why people had issues with reva on obi-wan kenobi that one baffled me the whole thing baffled me the the backlash baffled me i do think that that star wars overhyped just how much backlash there was to that the yeah. the the actress did get racist comments directed at her but you know it looked like it was a few dozen not the thousand people calling me a pedophile that jk rowling released on me um, the the problem is that the reva character was written to be unlikable and that, I mean, that and was my because, complaint with it. Because she's a villain. And right. I'm like, the problem is the actress did too good a job. And it comes back to people can't seem to separate the actor 
from the character they play. But it's she just... did too good a job playing an utterly despicable character. It's just so <laughs> weird that the dark side is all about you know fear leads to anger anger leads to hate hate leads to the dark side she's on step anger yeah right like what i don't what was wrong that that was just something that somebody said it and it just caught fire because people are just so raw and i i do think that at this point there are these communities created around a share hatred of modern star wars yeah and similar with brie larson the brie larson thing has just gotten ridiculous at this point people just hate her because they hate her yeah but well, i mean i i got to the point where star wars made me angry just any mention of it of it i'm like i can't i can't do this anymore i can't even say i'm a fan because well, everything just makes me angry and so that's the like, definition of toxic right yeah, yeah. which is why in order to get me to even look at the Mandalorian, my best friend had to say, so one, baby Yoda. Yeah. Two, the Waititi is a droid that gets melted down. And I'm like, okay, I'm here. Yeah, I, I the way uh, the way he plays a heel in uh, The Free Guy 2 was quite good. I th- See, there's a guy who knows some people think he's obnoxious and leans mm-hmm. into it. And I respect yeah. the shit out of that. Those are the people I model myself after because the reality is if you change every time you are criticized, that just creates more toxic criticism, right? And you do, the, the most terrifying element of this is that in order to really combat the toxicity and truly stand up for the well-meaning fans that just either you know, have a moment or have sincere pain that they don't express well, because traumatized people don't express themselves well. We know no. this. I I, yeah. I remember what it was like to be right in the middle of it. I I couldn't accurately describe what I was ha- what was happening to me. So I have a lot of sympathy in that regard. Mm-hmm. But you know, the only way to do it is to be prepared to t- to handle the dog piles and you know websites getting nuisance hacked and people lying about you and going after your sponsors and going after your employer because all this happens it's happened to me I don't talk about it a lot because that just encourages it but you know people stalking you people lying about you people taking hate blogs at you that's the reason I find it strange that people who know me are objecting to she hulk because all that stuff that happens to jen on that show happened to me and i have to sort of bite my tongue against my own emotional reaction when i see people complaining about this of are you saying this stuff isn't real are you saying this stuff doesn't actually happen to people because if it happens to people why aren't they allowed to tell stories about it just because it makes you uncomfortable Uh right But I bite my tongue about that because that's not, they're not seeing themselves in Jen. And this is the problem with these properties that have, well, okay. It's not the problem with the property. It's been the problem with the discourse surrounding diversity and inclusion, right? The theory Uh of the case is that people are apparently only able to identify with people who look like them and act like them. It, that bothers me so bothers much me too. because you know there's the saying don't judge a man until you walk a mile in his shoes right um there was actually a middle grade young adult book way way back called walk two moons mm-hmm. which it's this native american girl and she's following the path her mother left while traveling with her grandparents or something like that. And so Mm -hmm. they use the Native American walk two moons and another man's moccasins. Right, right, right. (laughs) And because the book left an impact on me, that that's, that's the version of it. that's always stuck with me. Right. But, you know, we see these movies that are coming out and the, like the response to turning red, where (laughs) 
people yeah. were just like, I can't relate to this. Okay, well, you're not necessarily supposed to relate to it, but what can you learn from it? Yeah, that, that's that, a good way of putting it. That That's the thing about storytelling is it's not just supposed to be that you want a character who fits you and you see yourself in. It's you want to be able to learn how someone else thinks and how from someone else's experience and then you can learn use that and learn how to relate to more people who aren't like you yeah and i i think that that also falls to an extent somewhat at the at the feet of postmodern criticism as well because Mm -hmm. so much media criticism has been about character right and about alleged theme and not about the execution of that theme and the big problem with especially animated stuff is that there's two there's two schools of animation pacing everything before clone wars and everything after clone wars became a phenomenon clone wars radically changed the pacing and how voiceover dialogue is done in animation and i like the clone wars cartoon i Mm -hmm. cannot i cannot stand that everything is adopted, that Clone Wars staccato clipped vocal delivery because they were supposed to be clones. I didn't even realize it had that big an impact. Oh, it drives me crazy because I do voice work, right? Yeah. And so I see this stuff as like, shit, they're doing Clone Wars. And Clone Wars is all very clipped like this because they're supposed to be sounding like robots in some way or another. And it's very exciting and it's easy to understand on computers because people are watching on streaming now, but I can't stand it. I, because, you know, you go back and I watched, it was um, Emperor's New Groove. I oh, watched I that movie um, after a Clone Wars binge and a Rebels binge. Yeah. And the the voice, you know, the voice is very slacker you know, early aught, slacker, dialogue, it's it's David Spade, right? It's all very (laughs) cadence, like, 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 like like this, right? And it's a completely different vocal, and it, you you know, it used to be whenever I did voice work for people, I'd give them a bunch of really fun takes, and they'd pick the Disney princess voice, Mm -hmm. of course. Now, if I do stuff like that, they always pick the Clone Wars take, and I think that because one of the things I do with people with She-Hulk when they're really ramped up, I said, okay, I'm going to stop you. Do you like Rick and Morty? And 85% of the time they'll say no. It's like, okay, well, that's a style thing. You know, there, I think the reason some people like the later episodes is the pacing of the show settled the fuck down. Yeah. Right. And if you don't I don't like Rick and Morty that's why I'm surprised how much I am enjoying She-Hulk because I found the first episode somewhat Rick and Morty exhausting in that it was very rapid fire things just happened randomly if you stopped and tried to think about it at all it didn't make sense it's also they were basically trying to cover an entire origin movie in a 30 minute episode and apparently that that courtroom scene was originally supposed to be episode eight and they put it in the first episode because they wanted to establish everything that quickly so it it was like all over the place and kind of a mess but there was enough you know once we got to bruce and jen in mexico it was gold yeah but getting to that was very running around screaming very nickelodeon animation And if you don't like that, (laughs) you don't like that. But it seems like a lot of people are having an emotional reaction and then just flipping out about it instead of stopping. And and this this isn't fair to expect people to do because it takes some work to be able to separate yourself from your emotional response enough to go, okay, why am I having this reaction? And you know the pacing on the first two or three episodes of she-hulk is exhausting it's rick and morty but if people love rick and morty i don't know why that's a problem the thing is a lot of guys are getting lumped in 
oh, you just don't like that she's female, when what they really don't like is the Rick and Morty pacing. Yeah. And I think that that's, I mean, it's the sort of thing where I don't like Rick and Morty pacing, but I understand a lot of people like Rick and Morty. So I have to pick up, I have to put up with the Rick and Morty influence the same way I have to put up with the Clone Wars influence. It's popular. Of course, Hollywood's going to copy it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I watched The Boys Diabolical and there's a Rick and Morty episode and it's straight up Rick and Morty. And it's like, I roll my eyes at the art style, get a few chuckles at the parts that I think are legitimately funny. But at the end of it, I'm like, that was Rick and Morty because of course it is because it's popular and people will watch it. And that's the reality of the entertainment industry. And so I'll be like, oh my God, Cuphead's amazing, right? The Cuphead show is so good. And I'd rather spend my time talking about how good Cuphead is than talking about how much I don't like Rick and Morty. But that doesn't, that doesn't pop on YouTube's algorithm the same way hating on stuff does. It's also just less fun to watch. I don't know. I uh, there's a there's a YouTube channel called Better with Bob, and he does these things about you know why Charmed is the greatest show ever, and he really loves Power Rangers and all that stuff. I just find it a warm hug. See, I I think part of my frustration is because usually when I see reviewers talking about something they like, mm -hmm. like well I'm not gonna spoil it. So go watch it yourself. And it's like, I'm not going to watch it myself. I want you to give me all the gritty details okay. and tell me the story. That's very interesting feedback because I used to do content like that. And I'd always get, oh my God, spoilers. Oh my God, spoilers. It's like this thing has been out for two fucking years. Okay, I, I should clarify this. Limitations. I do not care about spoilers. I'm like really weird in that I want I to know everything. I don't <laughs> care about spoilers either. Most of the stuff I read is over 60 years old at minimum. I already know what happens. It's the journey. Yeah. I think, see, that's why I'm so bummed by all this prequel stuff, right? Because I love it. When something that stands the test of time, you know exactly where it's going. Mm -hmm. But how they get there is so good right and i i think that was something that really annoyed me i think it was back in so i don't watch westworld but i remember hearing that i think it was back in season two or something some of the fans online had figured out an upcoming twist and so the writers went and they rewrote it oh i wonder which one that was and i was so frustrated because just because the fans figured it out doesn't mean it's going to ruin the twist for them. They're going to be even more excited that they figured it out. Well, especially since this most recent season, that was the joy of it, is if you understood um, machine learning philosophy, you could predict where it was going. It was incredibly satisfying. Maybe yeah. they learned from that. And and I think part of it is, it, it seems to be a little less so now, but for a, a while it was all the big twist. It's the big I deal. I hate that. But, yeah. But it, it was also like, okay, it, but if you've written and set up for this twist and you've done it in a way that people can see what's coming, if they're paying attention, then if you go in and change it, you've just undermined your own story. Well, that, I mean, that completely, ru two things ruined WandaVision for me. Two, not enough vision, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. it was, I wanted a story about both of them and it was a story yeah. about her, right? Yeah. But also, it, I went in going, this is just going to be House of M with a side of the 67 arc, right? Where yeah. vision, Wanda and Vision were living in domestic bliss with their kids. All right, fine. Expectations set. And then there was all this online speculation about Easter eggs and and freaking Mephisto, uh, Mephisto and uh, what was the other one? Uh, Kang was going to be in it. And 
spider woman references and all this crazy shit and by people about- figured out agatha from before she even walked on screen well agatha is a major part of scarlet witch so i i didn't really think that they were trying to hide that part yeah and i mean katherine hahn is fun- katherine hahn see talk about a cringe performance right that only works when you know where it's going because otherwise it seems so overacted and schmaltzy but when you recognize that she's gonna do the big scooby-doo villain mask off moment it's super fun yeah as a throwback right i mean she was great in that part i was so solidly on team agatha (laughs) by the end like she was she was right agatha was right about everything man but you know the the week to week speculation and everyone going crazy and i just got tired and i probably would have enjoyed that show much more had i just sat down now okay i was bored by episode four because they they went too long on the black and white sitcom format yeah and then they rushed the rest of the evolution of media but I I was so tired by the end that I think had I just sat down and binged watched it without all the hype surrounding it, I would have enjoyed the show a lot more. And that's its own form of fandom toxicity. The fact that you can't go online at all if you haven't seen the latest water cooler streaming show right yeah. like you're you're gonna get spoiled and some of the spoilers are uh, i don't care about it's fine others yeah. are sort of like oh that's a bummer that they because twitter could hide the spoiler tags right well when when grogu's name was revealed yeah in season two hey, Grogu. one i think i saw it trending yeah and two someone i was following said grogu i i don't know if i like that name and I was like, oh, uh, I haven't seen it yet. And she was like, oh, well, I, I thought it came out at this time in the U.S. because she's in Germany. Right. And I was like, yeah, it's out, but I had to sleep so right. I could go to work. <laughs> I had every single one of the Star Wars sequels spoiled, and I saw them on opening day. Yeah. Like, it, it, people were actively, if you said, okay, in the theater to see Star Wars, they would tweet at you spoilers. Like, there are just some people out there that want to ruin someone's day. And what I don't, you know, what, you know, what I don't understand is why the, why the companies, why the media makes that the default fan, why they normalize that instead of that is an aberration and you're just empowering them by making that seem like what a regular person does. (laughs) Well, you know, I, well, I'm totally fine with spoilers. And I'm like, okay, go ahead and tell me everything before I see it. Mm -hmm. Um, My best friend is the opposite. He does not like spoilers. And (laughs) so we've been watching House of the Dragon. And the other day I was like, oh, the new episode is out. You haven't seen it yet. And I ended up having to wait two days. Mm -hmm. He's like, you can go ahead and watch it. And I'm like, no. Because I know how you right. are with spoilers. And right. I know how I am with letting stuff slip. I'm not making right. you hate. <laughs> I the whole the whole spoiler thing just annoys me. If, you know, when I don't want something spoiled, I will stay off line. You know, House of the it, Dragon, I've had a bunch of stuff spoiled because I'm waiting <laughs> till the end. Cause I enjoyed Game of Thrones more the seasons I binged than the ones I had to wait week to week. And I can't do I can't do House of the Dragon and Rings of Power at the same time. I, I and Andor, holy shit! I I Ugh. only have so many spoons, you know. It, <laughs> the, every single one of those shows tests my patience in a different way. Though the bits I've seen of House of the Dragon, it's the least bad. I picked the wrong ones. <laughs> you know, I, I just, mean, I just care more about the Lord of the Rings than I do about George R. R. Martin. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I wanted to see dwarves. There are no dwarves in, <laughs> well, there, there were in, but, you know, Peter Dinklage isn't back in Game of Thrones. So no. in, in House of the Dragons, I, I don't care about the Targaryens. I just don't care about the Targaryens. I don't understand the, 
why of all the Game of Thrones families public consciousness focused on them other than Amelia Clark's got phenomenal screen presence I think dragons and they have the distinctive look I guess I just I don't know here's here's the thing I I wanted to like Game of Thrones from the beginning yeah because I'm like it's political intrigue yeah and we know I love my political intrigue and but I didn't watch it first because I knew how graphic and gratuitous it was and yeah, it, I it, say, it was this, yeah with this one it is still fairly graphic there's still blood but it's much more restrained that's what I've heard and so it's not random like there are a couple scenes where it's like there's breaths there's there's tits and ass of course but it is more pointed right and it doesn't feel so gratuitous and it's not oh i'm going to give you random exposition while i instruct two whores how to do their job it's funny that <laughs> scene didn't bother me because it was little finger yeah and it, 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 it didn't but so much it didn't I, so much bo- bother me the it stuff was- with daenerys in the first season really put me off i thought so many close like close-ups on amelia clark's areole that was yeah. completely unnecessary like what well, is just boob all of a sudden it's this extreme close-up on her nipple yeah. i was like what is this i'm actually feeling sick for the actress yeah and you know i think the interesting thing about house of the dragon for me is i actually feel like it is a realistic it, you know they talked about oh, well, we're examining women's struggles in that era. And I actually feel like they've done a really good job. Oh, good. It. Okay. Good. Because you were, you were put off by some of the press initially. Yes. Yeah. But th- there's a scene in the first episode. Um, it's the C-section. Right. Which I assume you've heard about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and was, people said, don't watch it because of this. And I'm like, oh, this is okay. alone going to put me th- off. It, it is a bit bloody, but I, I was actually expecting it to be a lot more like graphic in your face. Right. And showing the cuts and everything. Because people but, went mental over that scene. Well, what's interesting is it's not that it's graphic, but it's that her choice is completely taken away. Right. And she isn't even told what they're going to do because well, it's her husband's choice. That is what happened. Which is realistic. And yeah. so it gave me a new understanding of what it was like for women in those eras. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. I come at things with, I have this very romanticized view and I want everything to be pretty and rose-scented and this and that. And so I do come at things from a very ideal idealized view. But it... It... It worked for me. Like it, it was unsettling and a little disturbing, but it did give me a new understanding. And I'm like, okay, if you actually want to talk about women's issues, mm-hmm. this works for me more than trying to shove something down my throat because the horror on her face as she realized. Yeah. And you know, people I've seen people go, oh, Viserys, he's He's so horrible. How dare he do that to his wife? How dare he claim he still loves her? Because he still wears her wedding ring. Mm-hmm. And there's a point where we see him crying as he kisses it. And it's like, you can't judge him by modern standards and try to say that he didn't love her because he did this. Oh, and if people don't mm-hmm. think that people, men and women alike in positions of power, do that to this very day, they don't understand how power works. Yeah. And it's Viser- Viserys is a bad king, but he's trying his best to be a good yeah. father the, and a good person. The reason characters like Homelander and Viserys and the terrible people on TV shows, especially premium cable, are so good and the the good people, the more common salt of the earth people are so weak is that's the type of people that inhabit the entertainment industry. People are just writing what they know. Exactly. 
bears, it still happens with women. I know every time, every time when I was on television that a bunch of guys on a production went into a room without me and closed the door, a decision was made that I wasn't going to like, and I was going to be stuck doing it. And Mm -hmm. it is so degrading. And it's not the, it's not the decision itself. It's that I wasn't involved in it and then I'm stuck doing it. Yeah. And they give women producer credits on these shows. And this is another thing about attacking creators that people have to recognize. A lot of time people are given credits in lieu of pay because there's a back end structure. Yeah. But they don't actually get a say in the content. It is so top down and controlled on this stuff. I mean, Disney, Disney was pretty great when I did uh, theme work for them, Mm -hmm. but you know, they did, I was playing Korra from Tron Legacy and they told me to stop quoting the original Tron movies. And I'm like that, I'm not, what? They said, yeah, it's, it's not in the new film. We don't want to be setting that expectation. It's like, fuck <laughs> all right sure and of course i did it because they were very nice and, and they gave me a lot of leeway otherwise but i was like whoa all right sure um but yeah it's so tightly controlled you're told what to say you're told what not to say and the unfortunate thing is that people consciously know this right uh-huh. but they go so crazy they lose their minds so badly that they just lash out at the first person they can get and the studios know that that is going to be an actor or an actress not the people who actually made the decisions and it's interesting because there's a a, there's a new show it's a spinoff of the rookie called rookie feds Mm -hmm. and uh there's a character in it who's a you know, one of these cheesecake boy toy actors who wants to be an FBI agent because he's been typecast. Yeah. And one of the other officers profiles him basically is, you know, based on his characters. And he says, you know, most actors don't get a choice about what characters we play. We take the work we're given and then we get typecast. And I thought that was a really interesting nudge wink on the whole way people interact with media and again for people feeling like i'm 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 slagging the fans right now look up any any postmodern critical theory think piece on media it does it too you know they go after actors for getting work the amount of crap the 50 shades of gray actors took for taking those parts you know, you you turn down parts when when you're establishing yourself as an actor, you don't get hired again because you're labeled trouble. And the way they just go, I mean, they go after Aquafina for the way she talks and they go after, um, oh God, it, it's been pretty ridiculous about, you know, they- You, you know, with, with Aquafina's accent and people being like, oh, it's, it's, you know she's culturally appropriating an african-american accent it's i always think of there's a joke in the j michael straczynski run of amazing spider-man mm-hmm. where he introduced a, a character called the tailor who yeah. does yeah. costumes for heroes and villains and uh, he's a uh, black lightning character too they got a guy who's a tailor <laughs> so but he's specifically he's this old tailor who lives in queens yep and at one point he gets Spider-Man and he says, I wanted someone from the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And Peter says, well, how, how do you know I'm from the neighborhood? Yeah, and the guy looks at him and says, ask me again in a Queens accent why I think you're from the neighborhood. Right. <laughs> it's like, so technically Peter should have that same accent. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole thing about Marvel and why so many characters are set in New York, but they're all in different boroughs of New York because New York is like that. People don't leave their neighborhoods, maybe to go to work, but they live, work, play within a few blocks. It it is really segmented that way. 
and I mean, we, London's we got the that, same way. Yeah, and we got that joke in Civil War, which was Peter and Cap, where it's like, you're from Queens? I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah. Or something like that. Well, it's funny because some people said that, you know, only... Uh, I was on a stream and they said only the non-white characters have their their origins made a big deal out of like where they're from and stuff like that. And I'm sitting here thinking, no, there's major regional differences between well, Captain America, Spider-Man, Tony Stark. You know, it's um, it's there, but if you're not if you're not aware of the code you don't catch it true but i mean also you know people talk about there's been people who said they want to see uh peter parker race bent but it's like it, his family is actually irish then why why uh, we have miles morales yeah so there was a point i i don't remember where it was but it it was a big deal for a little bit and it was like Miles had been created, but he wasn't in the public consciousness okay. yet. So there was a lot of talk about, yeah, we want to see Race Bent Peter. And again, it's like he's there's also this theory that he's Jewish because Stan Lee was Jewish. And no, Peter Parker is no, not Jewish. Peter Parker's not Peter Jewish. Parker is Irish Catholic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's so frustrating. And again, it's because that's oh, who he... lived in the same neighborhoods as the Jews in the 60s. Yeah. yeah and so they're and that's another frustrating thing stan lee created him of course he's jewish no no <laughs> ben grimm is uh moon knight yeah. is but no peter's not yeah and every every time we've seen peter interacting with any kind of religious ceremony it's always been christian right and so yeah just but you know there's there's people it's you cannot argue with them they're like he was created by a jewish creator so he must be jewish and because some someone online said the same thing and it's like then this is part of what i i do get a bit gatekeepy and it's like get out of my fandom if you're not gonna respect but that, the that's so that's that's what the same people would claim would be exoticizing if i mean that's what i thought the the shang chi movie really stepped out against is the fact that they're from the bay area right they're from san francisco they're not from hong kong you know they're not from beijing they're from america and that was a major part of the story and i really liked that that that's as american a story at, that's why he's wearing sneakers mm -hmm. right and so i thought aquafina was the right casting because of this whole idea of this you know this legacy this heritage that you're you're somehow supposed to embody but you've never known you know when 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 you grow up in freaking seattle <laughs> like come on that the expectations are just so stay in your lane yeah even in the crazy rich asian movies there's you know the main character is going to singapore to meet yeah. her boyfriend's family and she and her mom are clothes shopping and she's like mom i'll be fine i'm chinese and her mom's like no, no. you're chinese american yeah you're totally different and even her friends are like no you're uh yeah <laughs> see I, I have i have friends who went on a disney cruise to china mm -hmm. and you know they they really put they really put on a show for the uh the tourists but they mistook my friend and his sister for locals and so they just treated them like shit they actually closed the doors on them in one of the panda exhibits and so they actually got cut off from the rest of the tour and the tour guide had to go back and tell them no no they're canadian it was <laughs> it was something of a deal but it just it 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 tells you how much face is involved in in some of that stuff as well and how certain cultures value the human life of their own people but i think that's probably that's that's a pretty good segue i think to to go back into this this thorny problem of solutions again right yeah um, and see the problem with solutions is one 
everybody loves to point out problems. Pointing out problems is popular. People feel bad. People feel good when a problem is identified. But yeah. any solution is is going to be incomplete and somewhat unsatisfying accordingly. And then the thing is that solutions also require work from the people involved. Because it's like, for me, the best thing I can think of is I would advise people to watch movies and read books about people who are not like them to learn someone else's experience. Yeah, and then you but, get into the, oh, it's cultural appropriation. I don't fucking care. Do it anyway. Yeah. I agree with you. Do it anyway. I mean, there's some real... I don't know of any author who you know is is a so-called minority who only wants people from their culture to read or watch or listen to their stuff that is no one representing a culture does not mean it's made exclusively for that culture that's not what they want just because somebody's not a primary audience but then on the other hand don't watch something like turning red and your comment is I didn't relate to it. Yeah. Do, do and, and this is the part where I think there is a valid criticism and something that I think people need to consider going forward. Do they really think that all these years of it being centered on straight white cisgender dudes, the rest of us related to that state? You know, no, women came at Spider-Man through Mary Jane. Yeah. Right? It it that's why Mary Jane was important. I I relate to Spider-Man in, in some ways, just because I can't win for fucking losing. There's never <laughs> enough money. But I'm not I'm not typical. I had to recognize I'm not typical. And I think that is where the raw wound happens the other way and why people have lost patience with some of the complaints. And I think this is fair. So even while we're defending sort of toxic fandom, I think it's fair to put this note in and hope people take it, that there is a lack of understanding that for years, a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people settled for close enough, right? Mm -hmm. That, okay, this isn't centering people like me in the story. I, I know that I didn't know how to behave as a kid because I found the the girls in the adventure fiction I liked kind of sickening. But if you acted like a boy, you got in trouble, mm -hmm. right? And so it was all sort of good enough. You found somebody that you could kind of sort of stick to. It's not a perfect match, but you get by. I think that that for most people was what it was like to read genre fiction right and now that it's opening up it does seem insensitive to to complain so vociferously that all of a sudden someone's not a particular type is not completely centered but that's not where the the complaints end and you seem to understand this part of it better than I do songs. So so maybe we can find a solution in this. The idea that, you know, in something like She-Hulk or something in Captain Marvel or something like that, Black Widow, I saw it and understood. And it got the least amount of complaining. That was the one where I thought, oh man, the, her, her arch villain is patriarchy and every guy in this is a fucking boob, you know? But... I, I think that might have gotten the least complaints because I don't think most people saw it. Well, I guess so, because that one, I, I would have been totally on side, but I'm not seeing that in She-Hulk. And the number of guys who, who I respect, they're good guys who are saying they feel like their identity is being attacked by that show. I don't know what to do about that because saying to them, well, I'm who the show is for and I'm not seeing that doesn't work. That doesn't no. seem to soothe them or reassure them at all. And I think it just comes back to the fact that we've had so many years of this fanboys are toxic and people online are toxic. And so then they see this thing that 
they tangentially relate to, even if it's just through labels. Because, I mean, look at Josh's screen name is yeah, Hulk he's, King. He's, he's, he's Josh. <laughs> well, yes, but there's there's still those little identifiers that people relate to. And they're also just kind of paranoid because they're so used to being villainized. It's funny. That- it's funny because my take on that character was he's the, if a guy seems too good to be true, he probably is character, which I thought was a defense of more awkward guys. See, I see where you're coming from and I also agree I saw him and I'm like this is mm, no this is not good this is almost as bad as the doctor well yeah at the, <sighs> at the wedding I'm like oh they're finally throwing a good guy her way and then it was it was this great slow burn of he's eating too much shit he keeps yeah. coming back for more something's not right here she made a complete fool of herself why ah uh, shit you know yeah. it it and uh, see i thought that was hey women have real expectations here right like you cannot carry on like a hot fucking mess and expect a good guy with no ulterior motives to think you're great that's what i took from that whole story and then i see guys saying we were the enemy look what happened all that's i'm like whoa this is making something about them that totally isn't and then I, and start I, thinking, I think well I, I start I, wondering okay do they actually think that women in superhero media are realistic depictions of how women actually are like all these female side characters uh, uh, you know the 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 hypersexualized uh, evil conniving scheming always have an agenda is that what they women are actually like yes well that's a problem right that see that's what i hear when guys start saying this show is attacking my identity because i sit back and think about the way women have been depicted historically in superhero media and it's the virgin whore dichotomy Mm -hmm. you know i mean she hulk really breaks the virgin whore dichotomy which is nice but that's the problem with these complaints it's like have you guys thought for all this time that the depictions of of women as you know bimbo slut side pieces in the comics you've been reading all the time do you think women are actually like that do you think women actually want to be like that do you think that that's something that's achievable that we can live up to all the time we gotta hit we gotta hit pause on this here you know (laughs) And see, there's there's this joke about men writing women, which is, you'll see male writers and the way they write women is just bizarre. Yeah. And I don't necessarily like the joke because there are some men who write amazing female characters. Yeah, Terry Pratchett, yeah. David Gator. Yeah. Miyazaki. Miyazaki, yeah. Uh, Jeff on Sage. Even, even uh, Kojima creates mm-hmm. very, very interesting women. And the key point is, and Miyazaki was the one who said this. He said, I don't write female characters. I write people. Right. And there is that we're like you, but different. <laughs> And yeah, it, it's hard to explain, but it's 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 different experiences. And yeah, I, I do think there are some sort of innate character traits, but I think there are more guys that are gentle and more women who are tough than than the world allows to exist. And yeah. I, I just I mean, I think back to that Daredevil show and I mean, who are the women on it? Electra, who's a psycho. You yeah. know, the too attractive woman in law school who is awful to them. And, you know, the women in that show aren't... Ex- and then and then Rosara Dawson is the night nurse. Okay, she's cool. But is that... Has this media so warped 
these guys views of what women are actually like that they actually didn't see the problem for years i think there's also the drawback that you know we we talked about the frazetta eowyn picture yeah 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 she faces the witch king and i i made a comment and i was a little facetious with it that I think part of why Tolkien fans didn't like those pictures was because they didn't know what to do with yes. a woman like that. Yeah. And there there is this stereotype of men who and stereotypes are what they are for a reason mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. there is a grain of truth. And so we have so many people who they've turned to these nerd activities. And they they think they've been bullied because of them. They because of the nerd stuff. They don't quite realize that it's also just because they're socially awkward. And, um, and and I don't think people should be bullied for being socially awkward. I I just no, of course not. I I, I don't know how to keep going. I'm going to try to figure out how to formulate this thought. Yeah. So right? it's they because they've been outcast they haven't really interacted with women and that is why some of them get defensive when women start showing up in comic shops because it's like here's this strange creature i don't know what to do with it is it dangerous yeah it's the jk rowling reaction yeah especially if they've been bullied by girls in the past right and so so we get this thing where it's like they don't have experience with women and women are they have the stories they read they maybe have their sisters who are a whole different kind Mm -hmm. of creature and so they they don't they don't have that experience to understand this is just another person Mm -hmm. and that's why usually if they're friends with a girl she's one of the guys right and it's they don't even think of them as female Right, because they and, don't fit those pre-existing stereotypes. Yeah, and so I think it comes down to we have these these people who have spent their lives as nerds and they they just don't have this experience and they don't have much experience with women. And the ones who do are more understanding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it's still a bit of a drawback where it's they just don't have the experience. And so it makes women scary. And then, of course, you get the women who are vicious bullies and right. backstab and they're toxic. And, oh, this isn't, this creature is dangerous. It's an enemy. And, and it, it, it's funny because I do think that that is the change to Jen Walters that they did in She Hulk, that because it's now female writers, they made her more of a, they started off as a female nerd who Mm -hmm. talked a good game but it's very clear that her filters regarding men are gobshite yeah and i'm reading the show as jen makes very bad choices and that's why she ends up with bad men right because i mean wong was there even before uh uh daredevil and wong's great Mm -hmm. right bruce banner's great yes Yes, she's related to him, but still, there are good men on She-Hulk. And then Titania is awful. Jen's friends are kind of shallow. You know, it's just a group of people. But I see it the same way I always saw Mary Jane being bombshell attractive. I always saw Spider-Man comics through Peter's lens. Right. I, I saw mm-hmm. MJ as, as probably more of a girl next door that he just absolutely idolized. And so t- to him, she was the most beautiful girl in the world. And so that's the way they drew her through Peter's lens. Right. Mm-hmm. And I see She-Hulk the same way that Jen is talking to camera. This is all her POV. How she sees herself how she sees herself how she sees the world and she makes terrible choices and so you know the fact that she's not giving guys with more substance 
a chance because remember she meets all these guys through dating profiles right Mm -hmm. she's the one who decided to go on a date with a guy using i I keep going to the beard oil guy because that was such a beautiful a beautiful tangible detail of that would be a big red flag for me a guy who uses too much beard oil (laughs) because he's overdoing it right he is so obsessed with his opinions that his chin is sprouting jerry curl from the 80s you got to use a little of that shit man not not i'm very obsessed with beard game now (laughs) because it's a little shiny all right you're conditioning if (laughs) listening like that no that's gonna stain my clothes dude you know but and so she picked those dates right that was a dating Mm -hmm. app she signed up for those guys and and based on that it's very striking to me and i think i think this is guys seeing this through their own lens and why i think it's very important to talk about this stuff but in order for this to be productive guys have to start listening to the other side of this that just because nerd guys feel like they have to take what they can get and they don't have unlimited options with women no woman has unlimited options with men i don't care what anybody says when i was a professional pinup model like doing video games as a historically accurate world war ii pinup model and modeling for catalogs and doing pinup calendars i still had guys calling me fat and ugly there, there is no one who is universally loved. Everybody experiences rejection. Everyone has limited options. And I think that shows like this that do rattle the trees some, but that we can defend. Uh, there's an opportunity for dialogue, but I really think the window's closing on it, which is why I'm so desperate for... How, how do we get people to start reacting, to stop reacting and start listening without just basically going, oh, no, you're right about everything. It hates men because that doesn't do any good. Right. Uh-huh. Like saying, I understand your perspective. Here's another view. Isn't working. And that's some pretty deep trauma right there, because the guys who are having these reactions they're It's really surprised me. These are these are smart, charming, funny, you know, guys. I like them a lot, but I can't get them to to climb down, and it's really concerning me. It's actually got yeah. me kind of freaked out. I think you can tell because I'm like, wow, you know, I have I been enabling a lot of deep seated trauma all this time by not seeing this sooner. You know, because I, I I did sort of under I didn't understand the amount of the fury against Ray with Star Wars. I, I thought that was sort of a bit misplaced that and, and I said at the time, I, I I just think the whole thing's such a mess that she took it on the chin. Yeah. But the whole thing was start to finish all over the place. You you cannot you cannot pinpoint one detail on those movies that that made them the the it it was the development process and the fact that they didn't have a story plotted out from the beginning it was a weird handoff and it careened all over the place that that's the thing that confuses me most about those movies is it's like i don't like writing by committee right but at least have case, an outline yeah in a case like that i'm like aren't you guys supposed to be writing by committee isn't all this supposed to be how did this happen (laughs) yeah i mean i i did think with with some of the marvel stuff they are going to deep dive into setup Uh i i'm i'm so sick of secret war setup by this set by this point (laughs) i mean they're doing secret wars world war hulk kang and secret invasion setup all at the same time in the mcu right now and i'm like oh my god it is leading to unintended consequences because that intelligentsia stuff all the message boards and and the you know the creepy shit that's straight out of the comics yeah 
but with and it and it is very topical right very very topical now it seems like they're doing more secret wars 2015 than the original secret wars from the 80s which i i guess makes sense yeah but yeah like all that stuff is straight from the comics and people are going oh no it's this oh no it's that oh no it's some youtube youtuber that stole his mask from dr doom instead of actually being dr doom like are you listening to yourself but i mean it doesn't help that we don't have dr doom yet yeah it, i really get the sense that they're teeing up to him the way they were teasing kang yeah and i i think they're i give him credit for letting things hang i you know we talk about we don't like bathos we want the build up but i mean shit there's a happy medium yeah, right. it, it's all about that. That was the one thing Thanos was right about is balance. Yeah, we're seriously missing balance nowadays. Yeah, but I mean, the way he went about it was not balanced, and that was no. the weird way that Thanos was written. But yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess this is a point where you open it up to comment. And the problem is, every time I open it up to comments, I just get a lot of feminism has to fucking die, feminism has to go away. We solved this problem by getting rid of feminism. No guys that's not happening it's not happening you're, you're not gonna get rid of something going back to like mary wollstonecraft shelley it just that is not workable be reasonable <sighs> and you know it's not these these well if we just have come uh, enforce monogamy we're just like this is all no <laughs> no what and, and there are people that actually think that's the answer. Assign ugly women to get with ugly men and it'll solve the problem. I, I, I don't know how that works, but it, okay. It is just the most okay. I guess on paper, you maybe in ancient Sparta that might work but not not in our world i mean why is that good for either side that's going to lead to some very very unhappy relationships right yeah but there's there's got to be a way to get people to calm down i mean the thing is i know how to do it one on one you know i i know how to do de escalation tactics in a in a conversation the problem is the mass scale of these discussions and people the the imprecision of the medium and the way this stuff is being discussed and people reading way too much into tweets and and way too much into you know youtube videos and and just jumping the gun and i mean I, it, it's kind of cliche but i i think people need to go out and grow a garden or get some kind of hobby that is not fandom related see my i've tried that with people suggesting that and then they go out into the world and then they fail and it's so traumatizing for them that they they recess even harder yeah. into this stuff and i i just don't know how to deal with we're we're looking at I mean, my crap, my tinfoil hat theory is this all goes back to the world wars and the collective trauma that was faced by the world. And we've never quite dealt with how that changed the world and, and the way people interact in it. I agree. And we've, we've got to kind of tackle that. And I just think that the suck it up, buttercup, snowflakes, I ain't apologizing, come at me all that stuff and i say this is somebody who's really good at come at me bro you yeah know, that's a legitimate part of my personality i just that is what i do to back people off i don't believe that actually brings people together no it doesn't there there's a time to do that but then there's a time to go hold up chill let's just listen to each other and you can't See, the problem is people can't listen when they're so pent up and they're so traumatized that they need to talk. And it seems like everybody just needs to unload and they're all unloading on each other, which gives them more to unload. And, I, and the problem is a lot of times they're dancing around the real issues. 
yeah they're they're not and it's not deliberate but yeah they're not really connecting to the fact that this is this is going to be a bit woo woo but at the end of the day it does come down to family of origin and it, it does come down to you know how early life experiences set their expectations for the world yep there's there's no substitute for that and the work it requires when people didn't get that nurturing and I know I know comic books have done a lot for a lot of people in, in those environments I'm one of them but you still need to do the work you know, you, you still need to use those characters that inspire you to do better. You can't, you know, you can't claim to worship the good guys when you're acting like, you know, the people the audience isn't supposed to root for. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, think about how these heroes behave. Spider-Man falls apart in his private moments. He, he doesn't do it he doesn't do it publicly you know no until then it's all snappy one liners that's right yeah he it's does it with a smile and I, I don't know it's uh, we'll see we'll see what the comments do in terms <laughs> of solutions because uh, yeah I, I really think uh, you know Song the reason I want to talk about this is I do think something needs to be done there needs to be some sort of coming together, this talking about it as a woman's thing or a men's thing. It's not working because it's an everyone thing. Yeah. Right? These these things should be mass popularity. They have been calibrated to be for a while. People just, it, it wasn't truly balanced. And so people are like, well, these are for everyone. Guys, there's a reason Thor was using, was wearing those low slung jeans, right? They wanted women in the theaters. <laughs> that's where it started thor and captain america they wanted women to see superhero movies yeah so yeah we're getting that sound too so okay this has been two women talking hope you guys enjoyed it song you got anything to promote you got some new art up on some yes, of your I channels did. right yeah yeah um yeah a couple new pieces of art over on song w erickson on twitter writing on my ko-fi nothing new on my channel <laughs> Oh, because you've been doing stuff here. Yeah, I've got, yeah. Uh, there was a Kickstarter update uh, that came out to Song of Sparkle Muffin backers. If you guys didn't see the notification, I know some people don't with Kickstarter. The The fall update is out with uh, Princess Sparkle Pony's Battler and uh, some stuff about how the music's composed and a new parallax mapping system for the uh, the towns, which is was a bit of a challenge, but it's pretty exciting, the the improvement in how things looked. So it's been one step forward, two steps back, but we are making progress. So thanks everyone guys for watching. Look forward to your comments. Remember to subscribe to this channel, subscribe to Song's channel, check us out on social media, and just like stuff. Please like stuff. <laughs>